Chapter 3 of Frostiana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ice. The blasted groves their verdant pride resign, and waters hardened into crystal shine. Even the proud seas forget in tides to roll beneath the freezing of the northern pole. There waves on waves in solid mountains rise, and alps of ice invade the wandering skies. Broom. Ice is a brittle, transparent body, formed of some fluid frozen or fixed by cold. See chapter 1, Frost. The specific gravity of ice to water is various, according to the nature and circumstances of the water, degrees of cold, etc. The rarefaction of ice is supposed to be owing to the air bubbles produced in it while freezing. These, being considerably large in proportion to the water frozen, render the ice so much specifically lighter. It is well known that a considerable quantity of air is lodged in the interstices of water, though it has there little or no elastic property, on account of the disunion of its particles. But upon these particles coming closer together and uniting as the water freezes, light, expansive and elastic air bubbles are thus generated, and increase in bulk as the cold grows stronger, and by their elastic force burst to pieces any vessel in which the water is closely contained. But snow water, or any water long boiled over the fire, affords an ice more solid and with fewer bubbles. Pure water, long kept in vacuo and frozen afterwards there, freezes much sooner on being exposed to the same degree of cold than water unpurged of its air and set in the open atmosphere. And the ice made of water thus divested of air is much harder, more solid and transparent, and heavier than common ice. Ice Hills Ice hills are a sort of structure or contrivance common upon the river Neva at Petersburg, and which afford a perpetual fund of amusement to the populace. They are constructed in the following manner. A scaffolding is raised upon the river about 30 feet in height, with a landing place at the top, the ascent to which is by a ladder. From this summit, a sloping plain of boards, about 4 yards broad and 30 long, descends to the superficies of the river. It is supported by strong poles gradually decreasing in height, and its sides are defended by a parapet of planks. Upon these boards are laid square masses of ice about four inches thick, which being first smoothed with the axe and laid close to each other, are then sprinkled with water. By these means they coalesce, and, adhering to the boards, immediately form an inclined plane of pure ice. From the bottom of this plane the snow is cleared away for the length of two hundred yards and the breadth of four, upon the level bed of the river, and the sides of this course, as well as the sides and top of the scaffolding, are ornamented with firs and pines. Each person, being provided with a sledge, mounts the ladder, and having attained the summit, he seats himself upon his sledge at the upper extremity of the inclined plane, down which he suffers it to glide with considerable rapidity, poising it as he goes down, when the velocity acquired by the ascent carries it above 100 yards upon the level ice of the river. At the end of this course there is usually a similar ice hill, nearly parallel to the former, which begins where the other ends, so that the person immediately mounts again, and in the same manner glides down the other inclined plane of ice. This diversion he repeats as often as he pleases. The boys also are continually employed in skating down these hills. They glide chiefly upon one skate, as they are able to poise themselves better upon one leg than upon two. These ice hills exhibit a pleasing appearance upon the river, as well from the trees with which they are ornamented, as from the moving objects which at particular times of the day are descending without intermission. Icebergs Icebergs are large bodies of ice filling the valleys between the high mountains in northern latitudes. Among the most remarkable are those of the east coast of Spitsbergen. They are seven in number, but at considerable distances from each other. Each fills the valleys for tracts unknown in a region totally inaccessible in the internal parts. The glaciers of Switzerland, see Glaciers, page 62, seems contemptible to these, but present a similar front into some lower valley. The last exhibits over the sea a front 300 feet high, emulating the emerald in colour. Cataracts of melted snow precipitate down various parts, and black spiring mountains streaked with white bound the sides and rise crag above crag as far as the eye can reach in the background. At times immense fragments break off and tumble into the water with a most alarming dashing. In Phipps' voyage to the North Pole, page 70, we are told, a piece of this vivid green substance has fallen, and grounded in twenty-four fathoms water, and spired above the surface fifty feet. Similar icebergs are frequent in all the Arctic regions, 
and to their lapses is owing the solid mountainous ice which infests those seas. Frost sports wonderfully with these icebergs and gives them majestic as well as other most singular forms. Masses have been seen assuming the shape of a Gothic church with arched windows and doors and all the rich drapery of that style, composed to what an Arabian tale would scarcely dare to relate. Of crystal of the richest sapphirine blue, tables with one or more feet, and often immense flat-roofed temples, like those of Luxor on the Nile, supported by round transparent columns of cerulean hue, float by the astonished spectator. These icebergs are the creation of ages, and receive annually additional height by the falling of snows and of rain, which often instantly freezes, and more than repairs the loss occasioned by the influence of the melting sun. Thompson has a magnificent description of these icy regions. The muse thence sweeps the howling margin of the main, where, undissolving from the first of time, snows swell on snows amazing to the sky, and icy mountains high on mountains piled, seem to the shivering sailor from afar, shapeless and white, an atmosphere of clouds, projected huge and horrid o'er the surge, Alps frown on Alps, or rushing hideous down, as if old chaos was again returned. Wide rend the deep and shake the solid pole, ocean itself no longer can resist. The binding fury, but in all its rage, of tempest taken by the boundless frost, is many a fathom to the bottom chained, and bid to roar no more, a bleak expanse. Shagged o'er with wavy rocks, cheerless and void, of every life that from the dreary months flies conscious southward, Miserable they, who here entangled in the gathering ice, take their last look of the descending sun, while full of death and fierce with tenfold frost, the long, long night incumbent o'er their heads falls horrible. Such was the Britons' fate, as with first prow, what have not Britons dared. He for the passage sought, attempted since so much in vain, and seeming to be shut by jealous nature with eternal bars, in these fell regions in our Zena court, and to the stony deep his idle ship immediately sealed, he with his hapless crew, each full exerted at his several task, froze into statues, to the cordage glued the sailor, and the pilot to the helm. Ice Islands These are composed of a great quantity of ice collected into one huge solid mass, and floating about upon the seas near or within the polar circles. Many of these fluctuating islands are met with on the coasts of Spitsbergen to the great danger of the shipping employed in the Greenland fishery. In the midst of those tremendous masses, navigators have been arrested and frozen to death. In this manner the brave Sir Hugh Willoughby perished with all his crew in 1553, and in the year 1773 Lord Mulgrave, after every effort which the most finished seaman could make to accomplish the end of his voyage, was caught in the ice, and was near experiencing the same unhappy fate. See the account at large in Phipps' voyage to the North Pole. As there described, the scene, divested of the horror from the eventful expectation of change, was the most beautiful and picturesque. Two large ships becalmed in a vast basin surrounded on all sides by islands of various forms, the weather clear, the sun gilding the circumambient ice which was low, smooth and even, covered with snow, excepting where the pools of water on part of the surface appeared crystalline with the young ice. The small space of sea they were confined to, perfectly smooth. After fruitless attempts to force a way through the fields of ice, their limits were perpetually contracted by its closing, till at length it beset each vessel till they became immovably fixed. The smooth extent of surface was soon lost. The pressure of the pieces of ice, by the violence of the swell, caused them to pack. Fragment rose upon fragment till they were in many places higher than the main yard. The movements of the ships were tremendous and involuntary, in conjunction with the surrounding ice, actuated by the currents. The water shoaled to fourteen fathoms. The grounding of the ice or of the ships would have been equally fatal. The force of the ice might have crushed them to atoms, or have lifted them out of the water and overset them, or have left them suspended on the summits of the pieces of ice at a tremendous height, exposed to the fury of the winds, or to the risk of being dashed to pieces by the failure of their frozen dock. An attempt was made to cut a passage through the ice. After a perseverance worthy of Britons, it proved fruitless. The commander, at all times master of himself, directed the boats to be made ready to be hauled over the ice till they arrived at navigable water, a task alone of seven days, and in them to make their voyage to England. The boats were drawn progressively three whole days. 
At length a wind sprung up, the ice separated sufficiently to yield to the pressure of the full-sailed ships, which, after labouring against the resisting fields of ice, arrived on the 10th of August in the harbour of Smearingburg, in the west end of Spitzbergen, between it and Hacklite's headland. Blink of the Ice The forms assumed by the ice in this chilling climate are extremely pleasing to even the most incurious eye. The surface of that which is congealed from the sea water, for we must allow it two origins, is flat and even, hard, opaque, resembling white sugar, and incapable of being slid on like the British ice. The greater pieces, or fields, are many leagues in length, the lesser are the meadows of the seals, on which those animals at times frolic by hundreds. The motion of the lesser pieces is as rapid as the currents. The greater, which are sometimes two hundred leagues long and sixty or eighty broad, move slowly and majestically, often fix for a time, immovable by the power of the ocean, and then produce near the horizon that bright white appearance called the blink. The approximation of two great fields produces a most singular phenomenon. It forces the lesser, if the term can be applied to pieces of several acres square, out of the water, and adds them to their surface. A second, and often a third, succeeds, so that the whole forms an aggregate of a tremendous height. These float in the sea like so many rugged mountains, and are sometimes five hundred or six hundred yards thick, but the far greater part is concealed beneath the water. These are continually increased in height by the freezing of the spray of the sea, or of the meltings of the snow which falls on them. Those which remain in this frozen climate receive continual growth. Others are gradually wafted by the northern winds into southern latitudes, and melt by degrees of the heat of the sun, till they waste away or disappear in the boundless element. The collision of the great fields of ice at high latitudes is often attended with a noise that for a time takes away the sense of hearing anything else, and the lesser with a grinding of unspeakable horror. The water which dashes against the mountainous ice freezes into an infinite variety of forms and gives the voyager ideal towns, streets, churches, steeples, and every shape which imagination can frame. Union of Sugar and Ice by the Agency of Fire in the winter of 1799, says M. Acherby, I beheld at Stockholm a spectacle of a very uncommon nature, and such as I never, in all probability, shall see a second time. It was a sugar house on fire in the suburb on the south of the city. The accident being announced by the discharge of cannon, all the fire engines were immediately hurried to the aid of the owners. The severity of that winter was so great that there was not a single spot near where the water was not frozen to the depth of a yard from the surface. It was necessary to break the ice with hatchets and hammers, and to draw up the water as from a well. Immediately on filling the casks, they were obliged to carry them off with all possessable speed, lest the water should be congealed, as in fact about a third part of it was by the time it could be brought to the place where it was wanted. In order to prevent it as much as possible from freezing, they constantly kept stirring it about with a stick, but even this operation had only a partial effect. At last, by the united power of many engines, which launched forth a great mass of water, the fire was got under, after destroying only the roof, the house itself being very little damaged. It was in the upper stories of the building that the stock of sugar was deposited. There were also many vessels full of treacle, which being broken by the falling in of the roof, the juices ran down along the sides of the walls. The water, thrown up to the top of the house by the engines, and flowing back on the walls, staircases, and through the windows, was stopped in its downward course by the mighty power of the frost. After the fire was extinguished, the engines continued for some time to play, and the water they discharged was frozen almost the instant it came in contact with the walls already covered in ice. Thus a house was formed of the most extraordinary appearance that it is possible to conceive. It was so curious an object that everybody came to gaze at it as something wonderful. The whole building from top to bottom was incrustated with a thick coat of ice, the doors and windows were closed up, and in order to gain admission it was necessary with hammers and hatchets to open a passage. They were obliged to cut through the ice another staircase for the purpose of ascending to the upper stories. All the rooms and what remained of the roof were embellished by long stalactites of multifarious shapes and of a yellowish colour composed of the treacle and congealed water. This building, contemplated in the light of the sun, seemed to bear some analogy to those diamond castles that are raised by the imaginations of poets. It remained upwards of two months in the same state, and was visited by all the curious. The children in particular had excellent amusement with it, and contributed not a little to the destruction of the enchanted palace by searching for the particles of sugar, which were found in many places incorporated with the ice. 
glaciers. If any person, says Mr. Cox, could be conveyed to such an elevation as to embrace at one view the Alps of Switzerland, Savoy, and Dauphine, he would behold a vast chain of mountains, intersected by numerous valleys, and composed of many parallel chains, the highest occupying the centre, and the others gradually diminishing in proportion to their distance from that centre. The most elevated or central chain would appear bristled with pointed rocks, and covered, even in summer, with ice and snow in all parts that are not absolutely perpendicular. On each side of this chain he would discover deep valleys clothed with verdure, peopled with numerous villages, and watered by many rivers. In considering these objects with greater attention, he would remark that the central chain is composed of elevated peaks and diverging ridges whose summits are overspread with snow, that the declivities of the peaks and ridges, excepting those parts that are extremely steep, are covered with snow and ice, and that the intermediate depths and spaces between them are filled with immense fields of ice, terminating in those cultivated valleys which border the great chain. The branches most contiguous to the central chain would present the same phenomena, only in a less degree. At greater distances no ice would be observed, and scarcely any snow, but upon some of the most elevated summits, and the mountains, diminishing in height and ruggedness, would appear covered with herbage, and gradually sink into hills and plains. In this general survey the glaciers may be divided into two sorts, the first occupying the deep valleys situated in the bosom of the Alps and termed by the natives Valley of Ice, but which I shall distinguish by the name of Lower Glaciers. The second, which close the summits and sides of the mountains, I shall call Upper Glaciers. 1. The Lower Glaciers are by far the most considerable in extent and depth. Some stretch several leagues in length, that of Dubois, in particular, is more than 15 miles long, and above 3 in its greatest breadth. The lower glaciers do not, as is generally imagined, communicate with each other, and but few of them are parallel to the central chain. They mostly stretch in a transverse direction, are bordered at the higher extremity by inaccessible rocks, and on the other extend into cultivated valleys. The thickness of the ice varies in different parts. M. de Saussure found its general depth in the glacier de Bois from 80 to 100 feet, but questions not the information of those who assert that in some places its thickness exceed even 600 feet. These immense fields of ice usually rest on an inclined plane. Being pushed forward by pressure of their own weight, and but weakly supported by the rugged rocks beneath, they are intersected by large transverse chasms, and present the appearance of walls, pyramids, and other fantastic shapes, observed at all heights, and in all situations, wherever the declivity exceeds 30 or 40 degrees but in those parts where the plane on which they rest is horizontal or only gently inclined, the surface of the ice is nearly uniform, the chasms are but few and narrow, and the traveller crosses on foot without much difficulty. The surface of the ice is not so slippery as that of frozen ponds or rivers. It is rough and granulated, and is only dangerous to the passenger in deep descents. It is not transparent, is extremely porous and full of small bubbles, which seldom exceed the size of a pea, and consequently is not so compact as common ice. Its perfect resemblance to the congelation of snow impregnated with water, and its opacity, roughness, and in the number and smallness of the air bubbles, led M. de Saussure to conceive the following simple and natural theory on the formation of glaciers. An immense quantity of snow is continually accumulating in the elevated valleys which are enclosed within the Alps, as well from that which falls from the clouds during nine months in the year, as from the masses which are incessantly rolling from the steep sides of the circumjacent mountains. Part of this snow which is not dissolved during summer, impregnated with rain and snow water, is frozen during winter, and forms that opaque and porous ice of which the lower glaciers are composed. 2. The upper glaciers may be subdivided into those which cover the summits, and those which extend along the sides of the Alps. Those which cover the summits of the Alps owe their origin to the snow that falls at all seasons of the year, and which remains nearly in its original state, being congealed into a hard substance and not converted into ice. For although, according to the opinion of some philosophers, the summit of Mont Blanc and of other elevated mountains is, from the glistening of the surface, supposed to be covered with pure ice, yet it appears, both from theory and experience, that it is not ice but snow, for in so elevated and cold a region there cannot be melted a quantity of snow sufficient to impregnate with water the whole mass which remains undissolved. Experience also justifies this reasoning. M. de Saussure found the top of Mont Blanc only encrusted with ice, which, though of a firm consistence, was yet penetrable with a stick, and on the declivities of the summit he discovered beneath the surface a soft snow without coherence. The substance which clothes the side of the Alps is neither pure snow like that of the summits, nor ice which forms the lower glaciers, but is an assemblage of both. 
It contains less snow than the summits because the summer heat has more power to dissolve it, and because, the liquefied snow descending from above, the mass is penetrated with a larger quantity of water. It contains more snow than the lower glaciers because the dissolution of the snow is comparatively less. Hence the ice is even more porous, opaque, and less compact than the ice of the lower glaciers, and is of so doubtful a texture as renders it in many parts difficult to decide whether it may be called ice or frozen snow. In a word, there is a regular gradation from the snow on the summits to the ice of the lower glaciers, formed by the intermediate mixture of snow and ice, which becomes more compact and less porous in proportion as it approaches the lower glaciers, until it unites and assimilates with them. And it is evident that the greater or lesser degree of density is derived from the greater or lesser quantity of water with which the mass is impregnated. An Icy Epitaph a curious record of an accident occasioned by a downfall of ice is to be found as an epitaph on the son of the then parish clerk at Bampton in Devonshire, who was killed by an icicle falling upon and fracturing his skull. In memory of the clerk's son. Bless my eye, 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 here I lies in a sad pickle killed by icicle. In the year of Anno Domini 1776. How to make ice. In many countries, the warmth of the climate renders ice not only a desirable, but even a necessary article. Hence it becomes an object of some importance to procure it in a cheap and easy manner. For this purpose, in the East Indies, three or four pits are dug on a large open plain, each of which is about 30 feet square and 2 feet deep. The bottoms are covered to the depth of 8 or 10 inches with dried straw, or the stems of sugar canes. On this bed are arranged, in rows, a number of unglazed pans made of porous earth, about a quarter of an inch thick, and an inch and a quarter deep, which are filled about sunset with water that has been boiled and become cool. Early in the morning a coat of ice is found on the pans, which is broken by striking an iron hook into its centre, and then conveyed in baskets to the place of preservation. The most expeditious method, however, of producing ice consists in a combination of sal ammoniac with nitre. It was first discovered by Borhove, whose experiments were repeated and confirmed by Mr. Walker, apothecary to the Radcliffe Infirmary, Oxford, but he found that his thermometer sunk 32 degrees in a solution of sal ammoniac, when Borhove's fell only 28 degrees. Nitre alone reduced it to 19 degrees. On mixing the two salts in equal proportions, the power of generating cold was considerably increased, so that the water was cooled to 22 degrees, while the thermometer stood at 47 degrees in the open air. By adding some powder of the same composition and immersing in the mixture two small phials filled with water, he found it in a short time frozen. Having observed that Glauber's salt, when it retains the water of crystallization, produces cold in a state of solution, Mr. Walker made an experiment of its effects when mixed with the other salts before mentioned, in consequence of which the thermometer sunk from 69 degrees to 19 degrees and he obtained ice, while the thermometer stood as high as 70 degrees. Lastly, by previously immersing the salts in the water of one mixture and then making another of the cooled materials, he was able to sink the mercury in the thermometer to 64 degrees. Thus he froze a mixture of spirit of wine and water, in the proportion of seven of the latter to one of the former, and by adding a quantity of the cooled materials to the mixture in which this was frozen, the quicksilver fell to the extraordinary depth of 69 degrees. Various other methods of procuring artificial ice have been contrived, particularly by the aid of ether, but that volatile spirit is too expensive for domestic purposes, and a satisfactory account of the process would exceed our limits. How to make ice cream. Ice cream is prepared by mixing three parts of cream with one part of the juice or jam of raspberries, currants, etc. The mixture is then well beaten, and after being strained through a cloth, is poured into a pewter mould or vessel, adding a small quantity of lemon juice. The mould is now covered and plunged in a pail about two-thirds full of ice, into which two handfuls of salt should be previously scattered. The vessel containing the cream is then briskly agitated for eight or ten minutes, after which it is suffered to stand for a similar space of time. The agitation is then repeated, and the cream allowed to subside for half an hour, when it is taken out of the mould and sent to table. A Palace Built of Ice in the year 1740, the Empress Anne of Russia caused a palace of ice to be erected upon the banks of Neva. This extraordinary edifice was 52 feet in length, 16 in breadth, and 20 feet high, and constructed of large pieces of ice cut in the manner of freestone. The walls were three feet thick. 
The several apartments were furnished with tables, chairs, beds, and all kinds of household furniture of ice. In front of this edifice, besides pyramids and statues, stood six cannon carrying balls of six pounds weight, and two mortars entirely made of ice. As a trial from one of the former, an iron ball with only a quarter of a pound of powder was fired off, the ball of which went through a two-inch board at sixty paces from the mouth of the piece, which remained completely uninjured by the explosion. The illumination in this palace at night was astonishingly grand. Hamburg Ice Boat the body of this boat consists of wickerwork covered with leather to render it impermeable by water, and is remarkably light that it may be easily managed by one person, both on the ice and in the water. Its length, measured on the outside, is seven and a half feet in the keel, and twelve feet above from end to end. Its breadth, three feet at the bottom, and four at the upper part. The bottom of the boat is shod with two small pieces of iron, and by means of two hooks the boat may, with the greatest facility, be slided over the ice. In the lower part or body of the vessel there is a large opening, three feet long and fifteen inches wide, the four sides of which are secured by a framework to prevent the water from entering the vessel. Through this opening, also, the boatman is enabled to step upon the ice in those places where it is too uneven to admit the sliding of the boat, and to carry it by means of handles. Another advantage derived from this aperture in the middle of the boat is the counterpoise which a column of water in its centre produces, and thus prevents it from being overset, while the man who carried it over the ice immediately raises himself above the level of the water, and sits down in the vessel. But, in order to approach nearer to the person whose life is endangered, there is also employed a ladder with a long jointed handle, which is pushed forward and held by another assistant standing on the firm ice. On this ladder the boatman places himself, and advances as near as possible to the body immersed in the water. Having successfully extracted it, no time should be lost in laying it in a proper posture in the boat, for which purpose there is a kind of chair with an elevated back on the stern of the boat. Mr. Gunter, one of the most active members of the Hamburg Society for the Encouragement of the Arts and Useful Trades, informs us in the third volume of their Transactions, published in 1795, that he has often been present when unfortunate persons have been rescued from untimely death by means of the ice boat, and that the swiftness and dexterity with which this machine may be managed by expert assistance is almost incredible. Hence the vessel is not entrusted to any other but skilful hands, and during summer it is deposited in an airy place, and the leather preserved from becoming either too dry or mouldy. The whole of this useful apparatus costs only 150 marks currency, or about 10 pounds sterling, a sum so insignificant that while the city of Hamburg has built five such ice boats, the great city of London ought to be in possession of at least a hundred. To render assistance to persons in danger of drowning. This desirable object appears attainable by the proper use of a man's hat and pocket handkerchief, which being all the apparatus necessary, is to be used thus. Spread the handkerchief on the ground, and place a hat with the brim downwards on the middle of the handkerchief, and then tie the handkerchief round the hat as you would tie up a bundle, keeping the knots as near the centre of the crown as may be. Now, by seizing the knots in one hand, and keeping the opening of the hat upwards, a person, without knowing how to swim, may fearlessly plunge into the water with what may be necessary to save the life of a fellow creature. If a person should fall out of a boat, or the boat upset by going foul of a cable, etc., or should he fall off the keys, or indeed fall into any water from which he could not extricate himself, but must wait some little time for assistance, had he presence of mind enough to whip off his hat and hold it by the brim, placing his fingers within inside the crown, and hold it so, top downwards, he would be able, by this method, to keep his mouth well above water till assistance should reach him. It often happens that danger is descried long before we are involved in the peril and time enough to prepare the above method, and a courageous person would, in seven instances out of ten, apply to them with success, and travellers in fording rivers at unknown fords, or where shallows are deceitful, might make use of these methods with advantage. To recover persons apparently drowned, as recommended by the Humane Society. Let those who first discover an unfortunate object in this situation remove it to some house near, place it by the fire, and begin rubbing it with salt, volatiles, etc., and warm flannels. The head a little elevated, never attempting giving anything by the mouth till signs of recovery strongly appear, and let the person be kept from the crowd of people around him. The idea that the stomach is full of water, and thus obviates recovery, is very erroneous and prejudicial, as it is now fully and clearly established that the respiration being impeded is the sole cause of the suspension of life, and which, being restored, the vital functions soon recover their tone, and men are frequently lost from the absurd custom of rolling on casks, 
lifting the feet over the shoulders and the head falling on the ground. Construction of an ice house. An ice house is a repository for the preservation of ice during the summer months. The situation of an ice house ought to be towards the southeast, on account of the advantage of the morning sun in expelling the damp air, which is far more prejudicial to it than warmth. The best soil on which a house can be erected is a chalk hill or declivity, as it will conduct the waste water without the aid of any artificial drain, but where such land cannot be procured, a loose stony earth or a gravelly soil on a descent is preferable to any other. For the construction of an ice house, a spot should be selected at a convenient distance from the dwelling house. A cavity is then to be dug in the form of an inverted cone, the bottom being concave, so as to form a reservoir for the reception of wastewater. Should the soil render it necessary to construct a drain, it will be advisable to extend it to a considerable length, or at least so far as to open at the side of the hill or declivity, or into a well. An air trap should likewise be formed in the drain, by sinking the latter so much lower in that opening as it is high, and by fixing a partition from the top for the depth of an inch or two into the water of the drain, by which means the air will be completely excluded from the well. A sufficient number of brick piers must now be formed in the sides of the ice house for the support of a cartwheel, which should be laid with its convex side upwards for the purpose of receiving the ice, and which ought to be covered with hurdles and straw to afford a drain for the melted ice. The sides and dome of the cone should be about nine inches thick, the former being constructed of steered brickwork, that is, without mortar, and with the bricks placed at right angles to the face of the work. The vacant space behind ought to be filled up with gravel or loose stones, in order that the water oozing through the sides may the more easily be conducted into the well. The doors of the ice house should likewise be so formed as to shut closely, and bundles of straw ought always to be placed before the inner door for the more effectual exclusion of air. The ice to be deposited in this building should be collected during the frost, broken into small pieces, and properly rammed down in strata of about one foot thick, so that it may become one complete body. In those seasons when sufficient quantities of ice cannot be procured, snow may be substituted and preserved in a singular manner. Morse catching on the ice. The Russians who go out to catch the morse are hired for that purpose by a master or ship owner, who not only furnishes them with the necessary vessels, but fits them out with provisions, stores, and whatever they are likely to want on the voyage, but either agrees to give them a share of what they take, or pays them certain wages. The latter, however, seldom exceed five or ten roubles for the summer, a trifling sum when we consider the hardships, toils, and dangers attending this profession. The morse catchers usually take with them a year's provisions, as they are often obliged to pass the winter on board their ships. Every vessel has an oven for baking bread and cooking their victuals, for the supply of which they take the needful stock of wood. The only drink they carry out with them is water, with which when they go on shore they prepare quass. The time of departure varies according to circumstances. Some set out at the beginning of summer, when the white sea is free from ice, others not till autumn, especially if they intend to winter on the voyage. The greatest peril to which they are exposed at sea is that of being hemmed in by the driving masses of ice. In this case, the ice by its force beats in the sides of the vessel, and the morse catchers are then reduced to the dreadful alternative either of being buried in the waves on the spot, or of getting on the fields of ice floating at the mercy of the winds, till cold and hunger put an end to their sufferings. And yet it has happened, though very rarely, that some of these poor fellows have been brought alive to land on their flakes of ice. When the morse catchers are happily arrived at the place of their destination, the first thing they do is conduct their vessels to some safe anchorage where they generally find several little huts that have been constructed by their predecessors in this hazardous warfare, and then commit themselves to the small boats, of which every vessel takes with it one or two, to proceed to the conflict with the beasts of the ocean. This is usually done on the first fine day, because then the morses delight in going on land or on the ice to repose, and besides they are at times stimulated to leave their native element for a length of time for the purposes of copulation which business lasts with these monsters for a month or two, or to cast their young, or to rescue themselves from the bites of the sea lice, by which the morse in summer is perpetually tormented, and from which they have no other means of escaping than by fleeing into an element which deprives these insects of life. All these causes together collect them frequently on the beach, or fields of ice, in prodigious numbers. When the captors discover one of these multitudes, they must have the precaution to approach them against the wind, because these animals have so fine a smell that they perceive the approach of men with the wind at great distance, and then immediately take to the water, 
whereas in the contrary case they continue lying undisturbed, though they even see the boats advancing to them. Besides, the morse catchers by this means have the advantage, discovering sooner the place where this prey has couched, for these fat animals, especially in summer, emit far around them a horrid stench. When the captors have reached this formidable encampment, they immediately quit their carbuses or boats, armed with nothing but their pikes, cut off the way to the sea from the morses, and then pierce those animals which come first to save themselves in the water. As it is the way with the morses to scramble over one another in their attempts to escape, from the numbers of the slain there soon arises a bulwark, which effectually chokes up the passage to the living, and then the captors proceed with the slaughter till they have left not one alive. It sometimes happens that after such an engagement so great are the heaps of the dead that the vessels can only contain the heads or the teeth, and the people are obliged to leave the fat or blubber and the skins behind. But, easy as it is for the captors to conquer the morse by land, so dangerous is the conflict with these animals in their own element. We have only to recollect that the morse is commonly of the size of a large ox, and that, besides their sharp teeth, they are provided with two long stout tusks, for judging how a sea fight of this kind is likely to terminate. When any of the morses escape into the water before they can all be killed, the captors leap upon the ice and fall upon the animals with harpoons, which they strive to strike into their breasts or their belly, and to each of which is fastened a long cord. This done, they drive a stake into the ice, wind the other end of the long harpoon string around it, and are now drawn about on the piece of ice on which they stand by the animal till he has lost his strength, when they draw him upon the ice by the cord and kill him outright. But when the morses lie so near to the water that they can leap in ere the attack begins, then the captors fasten the cord, when they have thrown the harpoon, only to the head of the boat, which is then drawn by the huge animals so deep into the water that the sailors must all run immediately astern. The morse, having fruitfully endeavoured to get loose from the cord, rises erect upon the surface of the water and makes a furious attack on his persecutors. In this he is sometimes so successful as to shatter the boat with his tusks, or to throw himself suddenly by a proportionate leap into the midships. Then nothing is left to the crew but to jump overboard and to hold by the gunwale, till other morse hunters come to their assistance in this desperate situation. To mitigate the danger of these misfortunes, the captors not only previously take all proper measures, but it is even laid down by laws and regulations what conduct everyone is to observe during the voyage and in the actual encounter with the morses. Each of these companies consists generally of a master or pilot, two harpooners, two barreling people, a steersman, and several rowers, each of whom has his appointed duty. End of chapter 3 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 4 of Frostiana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cold. The sun had first his precept so to move, so shine, as might affect the earth with cold and heat. Scarce tolerable, and from the north call, decrepit winter, from the south to bring solstitial summer's heat. Milton. Heat and cold are nature's two hands, whereby she chiefly worketh. Bacon. Natural History of Cold The properties of cold seem to be directly opposite to those of heat. The latter increases the bulk of all bodies, the former contracts them. And, while fire tends to dissipate their substance, cold condenses them, and strengthens their mutual cohesion. But, though cold thus appears, by some of its effects, to be nothing more than the absence or privation of heat, as darkness is only the defect of light, yet cold is probably possessed of another quality, which has induced many to consider it as a substance of a peculiar nature. It is well known that when a continuance of cold has contracted and condensed bodies to a certain degree, if then its power be increased, instead of progressively lessening their bulk, it enlarges and expands them, so that extreme cold, like heat, swells the substance into which it enters. Thus fluids sensibly contract in a cold temperature, till the moment they begin to freeze, when they immediately dilate, and occupy more space than they possessed while in a state of fluidity. Hence, liquor frozen to ice in a close cask is often known to burst the vessel. When ice is broke on a pond, it swims up the surface, a certain proof of its being lighter or of a larger bulk than an equal quantity of water. This dilation of fluids, however, is probably owing to a cause very different from that of excessive cold alone, because the power of freezing may be artificially increased, while the intenseness of the cold receives no considerable addition, and, on the contrary, a substance capable of melting ice will increase the degree of its coldness. 
Thus, for instance, sal ammoniac mixed with pounded ice or snow melts either of them into water and increases their cold to a surprising degree, as is obvious from the effects of this mixture in sinking the thermometer. Hence the freezing of fluids cannot be entirely considered as a result of cold, but of some unknown property either in the air or water, which thus mixes with the body and for a time destroys its fluidity. Effects of Cold on the Human Frame Its immediate effects on the human body are contraction of the cutaneous pores and a temporary obstruction of insensible perspiration. Hence we perceive what is vulgarly called the goose skin, and the parts thus affected will not recover their usual elasticity till the spasm be removed, either by external or internal heat, or by friction which excites the latter. Beneficent nature has enabled our frail and complicated frame to support the heat and cold of different climates with equal facility, and though man has devised artificial means of defending his body against the action of cold, or more properly of retaining the inbred or vital heat, yet it often happens that, by exposure to extreme cold, the fingers, ears, toes, etc. are frozen. Thus, the natural heat of those parts is reduced to the lowest point consistent with life. If, in such cases, artificial heat be too suddenly applied, a mortification will ensue, and the frost-bitten parts spontaneously separate. Hence, they ought to be thawed, either by rubbing them with snow or immersing them in cold water, and afterwards applying warmth in the most careful and gradual manner, by which they will soon be restored to their usual tone and activity. Effect of cold on vegetation. Although excessive heat is seldom very injurious to vegetation in this country, yet the defect of that element, or in common language, excess of cold, is frequently destructive to the tender shoots of the ash, and the early blossoms of many fruit trees, such as apples, pears, apricots, etc. The blights occasioned by frost generally happen in the spring, when warm sunny days are succeeded by cold nights, as the living power of the plant has then been previously exhausted by the stimulus of heat, and is therefore less capable of being excited into the actions necessary to vegetable life by the greatly diminished stimulus of a freezing atmosphere. In the northern climate of Sweden and Russia, where long sunny days succeed the melting of copious snows, the gardeners are obliged to shelter their wall trees from the meridian sun in the vernal months, a useful precaution which preserves them from the violent effects of cold in the succeeding night, and by preventing them from flowering too early, avoids the danger of the vernal frosts. In a similar manner, the destruction of the more succulent parts of vegetables, such as their early shoots, especially when exposed to frosty nights, can only be counteracted by covering them from the descending dews, or rime, by the coping stones of a wall or mats of straw. Singular Effect of Cold in Lapland The effects of these extreme degrees of cold are very surprising. Trees are burst, rocks rent, and rivers and lakes frozen several feet deep. Metallic substances blister the skin like red-hot iron. The air, when drawn in by breathing, hurts the lungs and excites a cough. Even the effects of fire in a great measure seem to cease, and it is observed that though metals are kept for a considerable time before a strong fire, they will still freeze water when thrown upon them. When the French mathematicians wintered at Tournier in Lapland, the external air, when suddenly admitted into their rooms, converted the moisture of the air into whirls of snow. Their breasts seemed to be rent when they breathed it, and the contact of it was intolerable to their bodies, and the spirit of wine, which had not been highly rectified, burst some of their thermometers by the congelation of the aqueous part. Extreme Cold of Siberia Here, says Mr. Gmelin, we first experienced the truth of what various travellers have related with respect to the extreme cold of Siberia, for, about the middle of December, such severe weather set in as we were sure had never been known in our time in Petersburg. The air seemed as if it were frozen, with the appearance of a fog, which did not suffer the smoke to ascend as it issued from the chimneys. Birds fell down out of the air as dead and froze immediately, unless they were brought into a warm room. Whenever the door was opened, a fog suddenly formed round it. During the day, short as it was, parhelia and halos round the sun were frequently seen, and in the night mock rooms and halos around the moon. Finally, our thermometer, not subject to the same deception as the senses, left us no doubt of the excessive cold, for the quicksilver in it was reduced on the 5th of January, old style, to 120 degrees of Fahrenheit scale, lower than it had ever been observed in nature. Curious Effect of Cold on the Feathered Tribe In February 1809, a boy in the service of Mr. W. Newman Miller at Leybourne near Malling went into a field called the Forty Acres, and saw a number of rooks on the ground very close together. 
He made a noise to drive them away, but they did not appear alarmed. He threw snowballs to make them rise, still they remained. Surprised at this apparent indifference, he went in among them, and actually picked up twenty-seven rooks, and also in several parts of the same field, ninety larks, a pheasant, and a buzzard hawk. The cause of the inactivity of the birds was a thing of rare occurrence in this climate. A heavy rain fell on the Thursday afternoon, which, freezing as it came down, so completely glazed over the bodies of the birds that they were fettered in a coat of ice, and completely deprived of the power of motion. Several of the larks were dead, having perished from the intenseness of the cold. The buzzard hawk, being strong, struggled hard for his liberty, broke his icy fetters, and effected his escape. Miscellaneous Effects of Cold in Foreign Countries in Former Times The effect of severe cold in other countries and former times is thus mentioned by Martin du Bellay, who affirms that in Luxembourg journey the frost was so sharp that the ammunition wine was cut with hatchets and wedges and delivered out to the soldiers by weight, and that they took it away in baskets. Philippe de Comines, speaking of the cold in the Principality of Liege, anno 1769, says that the wine was dug out from the pipes, cut in wedges, and so carried off by gentlemen in hats or baskets. At the mouth of the Lake Maeotis, the frosts are so keen that on the same spot where the lieutenant of Mithridates had fought the enemy dry foot and given them a defeat, the summer following he also obtained over them a naval victory. The distress in the retreat of the allied armies from Moscow can be imagined if the comparison be made of the miseries the Greeks endured in retiring from Babylon to their own country. One of which was that being encountered in the mountains of Armenia with a storm of snow, they lost all knowledge of the roads, and were a day and night without eating or drinking. Most of their cattle died, many of them were starved, several struck blind with the driving of the hail and the glitter of the snow. Numbers were maimed in their fingers and toes, and also became motionless with the intense cold, although their understanding was not impaired. The Allied forces had a much longer duration of similar calamities to sustain and overcome. End of chapter 4 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 5 of Frostiana This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Northern Winters Fair winter armed with terrors here unknown, Sits absolute on his unshaken throne, Piles up his stores amid the frozen waste, And bids the mountains he has built stand fast, Beckons the legions of his storms away, From happier scenes to make the land a prey, Proclaims the soil a conquest he has won, And scorns to share it with the distant sun. Cooper before we describe the severity of foreign climes, we cannot do better than quote the following passage of the great Johnson, which we recommend to the serious attention of our readers. A native of England, pinched with the frost of December, may lessen his affection for his own country by suffering his imagination to wander in the vales of Asia, and sport among woods that are always green, and streams that always murmur. But, if he turns his thoughts towards the polar regions, and considers the nations to whom a great portion of the year is darkness, and who are condemned to pass weeks and months amid mountains of snow, he will soon recover his tranquillity, and, while he stirs his fire or throws his cloak about him, reflect how much he owes to Providence that he is not placed in Greenland or Siberia. A Winter in Stockholm The snow that begins to fall in the later weeks of autumn covers and hides the streets for the space of six months, and renders them more pleasant and convenient than they are in summer or autumn, at which seasons, partly on account of the pavement and partly on account of the dirt, they are often almost impassable. One layer of snow on another, hardened by the frost, forms a surface more equal and agreeable to walk on, which is sometimes raised more than a yard above the stones of the street. You are no longer stunned by the irksome noise of carriage wheels, but this is exchanged for the tinkling of little bells with which they deck their horses before the sledges. The only wheels now to be seen in Stockholm, says a Cherby, are those of small carts employed by men servants of families to fetch water from the pump in a cask. This compound of cart and cask always struck me as a very curious and extraordinary object, insomuch that I have taken the trouble of following it, in order to have a nearer view of the whimsical robe in which the frost had invested it, and particularly of the variegated and fantastical drapery in which the wheels were covered and adorned. This vehicle, with all its appurtenances, afforded to a native of Italy a very singular spectacle. The horse was wrapped up, as it seemed, in a mantle of white down, which under his breast and belly were fringed with points and tufts of ice. 
Stalactital ornaments of the same kind, some of them to the length of a foot, were also attached to his nose and mouth. The servant that attended the cart had on a frock, which was encrusted with a solid mass of ice. His eyebrows and hair jingled with icicles, which were formed by the action of the frost on his breath and perspiration. Sometimes the water in the pump was frozen, so that it became necessary to melt it by the injection of a red-hot bar of iron. Neither men nor women carry anything on their heads or shoulders, but employ small sledges which they push on before them. When they come to a declivity, they rest with their left hip and thigh on the sledge, and glide down to the bottom with a velocity which to a stranger appear both astonishing and frightful, guiding all the way the motion of the sledge with their right foot. The address with which they perform this, it is not easy for any one to conceive who has not witnessed it. If you add to the objects which I have been describing the curious appearance of many different palaces that are worn with the furs on the outside, you will imagine what a striking scene the streets of Stockholm in winter present to a foreigner, especially to one that came from the southern part of Europe. Preparations for Winter in Russia On the approach of winter the double windows are put up in all the houses, having the joints and interstices corked and neatly pasted with the border of the paper with which the room is hung. This precaution not only protects against cold and wind, but secures a free prospect even in the depth of winter, as the panes of glass are thus never encrusted with ice. The outer doors, and frequently the floors under the carpets, are covered with felt. Our stoves, which from their size and construction consume indeed a great quantity of wood, produce a temperature in the most spacious apartments and public halls, which annihilates all thoughts of winter. On leaving the room we arm ourselves still more seriously against the severity of the cold, Caps, furs, boots lined with flannel and a muff make up the winter dress. It is diverting to see the colossal cases in the antechamber out of which in a few minutes the most elegant bow are unfolded. The common Russian cares only about warm wrappers for his legs and feet. Provided with a plain sheepskin shoe, the drivers and itinerant tradesmen frequent the streets all day with their bare necks and frozen beards. In a frost of five and twenty degrees, it is common to see women standing for hours together rinsing their linen through holes in the ice of the canals. The winter increases the necessaries of life, and they are multiplied by luxury. To these belong the winter clothing, fuel, and candles. That people here run into great expenses in the article of furs may be well imagined, and the fashion varies so often that a man must be in more than moderate circumstances to be able to follow it. The consumption of wood is enormous. In the kitchens, bagnos, and servants' rooms, which are heated like bagnos, there is an incredible waste of this prime necessary of life in our climates. Upon a moderate computation here are annually consumed upwards of 200,000 fathoms, amounting in specie to about half a million of rubles. This formidable consumption and the rising price of wood are highly deserving of patriotic attention. The expense in tallow and wax candles is proportionately large. Throughout the long winter we live in an almost everlasting night, as our shortest day is only five hours and a half. In houses conducted on a fashionable style, the wax candles, as in England, are lighted long before dinner. Virgil's Description of a Scythian Winter Early they stall their flocks and herds, for there no grass the fields nor leaves the forest wear. The frozen earth lies buried there below, a hilly heap seven cubits deep in snow, and all the west allies of stormy Boreas blow. The sun from far peeps with a sickly face, too weak the clouds and mighty fogs to chase, when up the sky he shoots his rosy head, or in the ruddy ocean seeks his bed. Swift rivers are with sudden ice constrained, and studded wheels are on its back sustained. A hostry now for wagons which before tall ships of burden on its bosom bore, the brazen cauldrons with their frost are flawed, the garment stiff with ice at hearths is thawed. With axes first they cleave the wine, and thence, by weight the solid portions they dispense. From locks uncombed and from the frozen beard, long icicles depend, and crackling sounds are heard. Meantime perpetual sleet and driving snow obscure the skies and hang on herds below. The starving cattle perish in their stalls, huge oxen stand enclosed in wintry walls. Of snow congealed whole herds are buried there, of mighty stags, and scarce their horns appear. The dexterous huntsman wounds not there afar, with shafts or darts and makes a distant war, with dogs or pitches toils to stop their flight, but close engages in unequal fight. And while they strive in vain to make their way through hills of snow and pitifully bray, assaults with dint of sword or pointed spears, and homeward on his back the joyful burden bears. The men to subterranean caves retire, 
secure from cold and crowd the cheerful fire. With trunks of elms and oaks the hearth they load, nor tempt the inclemency of heaven abroad. Their jovial nights in frolic and in play they pass to drive the tedious hours away and their cold stomachs with crowned goblets cheer of windy cider and of balmy beer. Such are the cold raffian race, and such the savage Scythian and the German Dutch, where skins of beasts the rude barbarians wear, the spoils of foxes and the furry bear. Curious Description of a Russian Winter in 1603 The country differeth very much from itself by reason of the year, so that a man would marvel to see the great alteration and difference betwixt the winter and summer in Russia. The whole country in winter lieth under snow which falleth continually, and is sometime of a yard or two thick, but greater towards the north. The rivers and other waters are frozen up a yard or more thick, how swift or broad soever they be, and this continueth commonly for months, that is, from the beginning of November till towards the end of March, about which time the snow beginneth to melt, the sharpness whereof you may judge of by this. For that water dropped down or cast up into the air congealeth into ice before it come to the ground. In the extremity of winter, if you hold a pewter dish or pot in your hand, or any other metal, except in some chamber where the warm stones be, your fingers will freeze fast into it and draw off the skin at the parting. When you pass out of a warm room into a cold, you shall sensibly feel your breath to wax stark, and even stifling with the cold as you draw it in and out. Divers not only that travel abroad, but in the very markets and streets of their towns, are monstrously pinched and killed withal, so that you shall see many drop down in the streets, many travellers brought into the towns sitting dead and stiff in their sleds, and yet in summer time you shall see such a new hue and face of a country, the woods so fresh and so sweet, the pastures and meadows so green and well grown, and that upon the sedate, such variety of flowers, such melody of birds, especially of nightingales, that a man shall not lightly trail in a more pleasanter country, which fresh and speedy growth of the spring seemeth to proceed from the benefit of the snow, which all the winter time being spread over the whole country as a white rose, and keeping it warm from the rigour of the frost, in the springtime when the weather waxeth warm, and the sun dissolveth it into water, doeth so throughly drench and soak the ground, being of a slight and sandy mould, and then shineth so hotly upon it again, that it even forceth the herbs and plants forth in great plenty and variety, and that in a short time. As the winter season in these regions exceedeth in cold, so likewise I may say that the summer inclineth to overmuch heat, especially in the month of June, July, and August, being accounted the three chiefest months of burning heat, and yet in these places it is much warmer than the summer in England. Beautiful description of a winter at Copenhagen, in a letter from A. Phillips to the Earl of Dorset. From frozen climes and endless tracts of snow, from streams which northern winds forbids to flow, what present shall the muse to Dorset bring, or how so near the pole attempt to sing? The hoary winter here conceals from sight all pleasing objects which to verse invite, the hills and dales and the delightful woods, the flowery plains and silver streaming floods, by snow disguised in bright confusion lie, and with one dazzling waste fatigue the eye. No gentle breathing breeze prepares the spring, no birds within the desert region sing. The ships unmoved the boisterous winds defy, while rattling chariots o'er the ocean fly. The vast leviathan wants room to play, and spends his waters in the face of day. The starving wolves among the main sea prowl, and to the moon in icy valleys howl. O'er many a shining league the level main, here spreads itself into a glassy plain. There solid billows of enormous size, alps of green ice in wild disorder rise. And yet but lately have I seen even here the winter in a lovely dress appear. Ere yet the clouds let fall the treasured snow, or winds begun through hazy skies to blow. At evening a keen eastern breeze arose, and the descending rain unsullied froze. Soon as the silent shades of night withdrew, the ruddy morn disclosed at once to view, the face of nature in a rich disguise, and brightened every object to my eyes. For every shrub and every blade of grass, and every pointed thorn seemed wrought in glass, in pearls and rubies rich the hawthorns show, while through the ice the crimson berries glow. The thick-sprung reeds which watery marshes yield, seemed polished lancets in a hostile field, the stag in limpid current with surprise sees crystal branches on his forehead rise. The spreading oak, the beech, the towering pine, 
glazed over in the freezing ether shine. The frightened birds the rattling branches shun, which wave and glitter in the distant sun, when if a sudden gust of wind arise, the brittle forest into atoms flies. The crackling wood beneath the tempest bends, and in a spangled shower the prospect ends, or if a sudden gale the region warm, and by degrees unbind the wintry charm, the traveller a miry country sees, and journeys sad beneath the drooping trees, like some deluded peasant Merlin leads, through fragrant bowers and through delicious meads, while here enchanted gardens to him rise, and airy fabrics there attract his eyes. His wandering feet the magic paths pursue, and while he thinks the fair illusion true, the trackless scenes disperse in fluid air, and woods and wilds in thorny ways appear. A tedious road the weary wretch returns, and as he goes the transient vision mourns. The Single Night of Spitzbergen in the dreary regions of Spitzbergen, the snow exhibits phenomena not less singular than those of the ice. At first, it appears small and hard as the finest sand. It then changes its form to that of a hexagonal shield, into the shape of needles, crosses, sink foils, and stars, some plain and some serrated rays. These forms depend upon the disposition of the atmosphere, and in calm weather, the snow coalesces and falls in clusters. The single night of this dreadful country begins about the 30th of October, the sun then sets and never appears till about the 10th of February. A glimmering indeed continues some weeks after the setting of the sun, then succeed clouds and thick darkness, broken by the light of the moon, which is as luminous as in England, and, during this long night, shines with unfailing luster. The cold strengthens with the new year, and the sun is ushered in with an unusual severity of frost. By the middle of March, the cheerful light grows strong, the arctic foxes leave their holes, and the sea-fowl resort in great multitudes to their breeding-places. The sun sets no more after the 14th of May, the distinction of day and night is then lost. Vast regions dreary, bleak, and bare, there on an icy mountain's height, seen only by the moon's pale light. Stern winter rears his giant form, his robe a mist, his voice a storm. His frown the shivering nations fly, and hid for half the year in smoky caverns lie. Scott In the height of summer, the sun has heat enough to melt the tar on the decks of ships, but from August its power declines, it sets fast. After the middle of September, day is hardly distinguishable, and by the end of October takes a long farewell of this country. The days now become frozen, and winter reigns triumphant. Earth and soil are denied to the frozen regions of Spitsbergen, at least, the only thing which resembles soil is the grit worn from the mountains by the power of the winds, or the attrition of cataracts of melted snow. This, indeed, is assisted by the putrefied lichens of the rocks and the dung of birds, brought down by the same means. The composition of these islands is stone, formed by the sublime hand of omnipotent power, not fritted into segments, transverse or perpendicular, but cast at once into one immense and solid mass. A mountain throughout is but a single stone, destitute of fissures, except in places cracked by the irresistible power of frost, which often causes lapses attended by a noise like thunder, and scattering over the bases rude and extensive ruins. The valleys, or rather glens, of this country are filled with eternal ice or snow. They are totally inaccessible and known only by the divided course of the mountains or where they terminate in the icebergs or glaciers we have already described. No stream waters their dreary bottoms, and even springs are denied. The mariners are indebted for fresh water solely to the periodical cataracts of melted snow in the short season of summer, or to pools in the middle of the vast fields of ice. Yet, even here, Flora deigns to make a short visit and to scatter a scanty stock over the bases of the hills. Her efforts never rise above a few humble herbs which shoot, flower, and seed in the short warmth of June and July, and then wither into rest until the succeeding year. Among these, however, the salubrious scurvy grass, the resource of distempered frames, is providentially most abundant. Such, after all, is the aspect of extreme sterility and desolation in these dreary regions, that we can scarcely imagine any mortal who would be hardy as to make them even a temporary abode. Yet here did four Russian mariners, who were accidentally left on this frozen coast in the year 1743, live six years, one excepted, till happily released by the arrival of a ship. In 1633, seven Dutch sailors were voluntarily left here to pass the winter and to make their remarks, but they all perished from the effects of the scurvy. 
In the following year, seven more self-devoted victims of the same nation underwent a similar fate. Yet all these adventurous men had been liberally provided with medicines, and every necessary for the preservation of life. Eight Englishmen, left by accident in the same country in 1650, were far more fortunate. Unprovided with everything, they contrived, however, to frame a hut of some old materials, and were found by the returning ships the next year in perfect health. The Russians have lately attempted to colonize these dreadful islands. They have annually sent parties to continue there the whole year, who have established settlements at Spitsbergen and other places adjacent, where they have built huts, each of which is occupied by two boats' crews or twenty-six men. They bring with them salted fish, rye flour, and the serum or whey of sour milk. The whey is their chief beverage, and is also used in baking their bread. Each hut has an oven which serves also as a stove, and their fuel is wood which they bring with them from Archangel. Their huts are above ground and surprisingly warm. They boil their fish with water and rye meal. This is their winter diet. In summer they live chiefly on fowls or their eggs. They are dressed in the skins of the bear or the reindeer, with the fur side next to their bodies. Their bedding, likewise, is formed of the same. The skin of the fox, which is the most valuable, is preserved as an article of commerce. They have also other employment beside the chase in catching, with nets, the beluga or white whale. Few of them die from the severity of the cold, but they are often frostbitten so as to lose their toes or fingers, for they are so hardy as to hunt in all weathers. They are at liberty to leave the place by the 22nd of September, whether they are relieved by a fresh party from Russia or not. The great exercise they use, their vegetable food, their method of freshening their salt provision by boiling it in water and mixing it with flour, their beverage of whey, and their total abstinence from spiritous liquors are the happy preservatives from the scurvy, which brought all the preceding adventurers who perished to their miserable end. Sledges As sledges are much used in the northern countries, we shall briefly describe those used in Holland, Lapland, and Kamchatka. These carriages are without wheels, and are frequently appropriated for carrying large weights, as huge stones, bells, etc., etc. The sledge on which a criminal is taken to the place of execution is called a hurdle, but in cold countries sledges are substituted for wheel carriages, being more convenient for travelling on the ice and over the boundless snows. Dutch Sledges By the polite laws of Amsterdam, Wheel carriages are limited to a certain number, which is very inconsiderable compared with the size of the city, from an apprehension that an uncontrolled use of them might hazard the foundation of the houses, most of which are built upon piles, for nearly the whole of the ground on which this vast city stands was formerly a morass. A carriage, called by the Dutch a sleigh and by the French a traineau, is used in their room. It is the body of a coach fastened by ropes on a sledge, and drawn by one horse. The driver walks by the side of it, which he holds with one hand to prevent its falling over, and with the other the reins. Nothing can be more melancholy than this machine, which holds four persons, moves at the rate of about three miles an hour, and seems more like the equipage of a hospital than a vehicle in which the observer would expect to find a merry face, yet in this manner do the Dutch frequently pay visits and take the air. Dogs are frequently employed in Holland to draw light sledges fitted for the conveyance of provisions, etc., to a short distance. In Holland, according to Mr. Pratt, there is not an idle dog of any material size to be seen in the whole seven provinces. You see them in harness at all parts of the Hague, as well as in other towns, tugging at sledges or little carts with their tongue nearly sweeping the ground, and their poor palpitating hearts almost beating through their sides. Frequently three, four, five, or sometimes six abreast, drawing men and merchandise with the speed of little horses. On passing from Hague Gate to Scheveling, you perceive at any hour of the day an incredible number loaded with fish and men, under the burden of which they run off at a long trot, and sometimes at full gallop, the whole mile and half, which is the precise distance from gate to gate. Nor on their return are they suffered to come with their sledges empty, being filled not only with the men and boys before mentioned, but with such commodities as are marketable at the village. This writer further adds that it is no uncommon thing in the middle of summer to see these poor, patient, persevering animals urged and driven beyond their utmost ability till they drop down on the road. Ship Sledges The Dutch have also a kind of sledge on which they can carry a vessel of any burden by land. It consists of a plank of the length of a keel of a moderate ship, raised a little behind, and hollow in the middle, so that the sides go up a little slope and are furnished with holes to receive pins, etc. The rest is quite even. Lapland Sledges 
These carriages are extremely light and elegant, and are covered at the bottom with the skin of the reindeer. They are yoked to the sledge by a collar, from which a trace is brought under the belly, between the legs, and fastened to the forepart of the machine. The person who sits in it guides the animal with a cord fastened to its horns. He drives it with a goad and encourages it with his voice. Those of the wild breed, though by far the strongest, often prove refractory, and not only refuse to obey their masters, but turn against him and strike so furiously with their feet that his only resource is to cover himself with his sledge, upon which the enraged creature vents his fury. The tame deer, on the contrary, is patient, active, and willing. When hard pushed, the reindeer will trot the distance of sixty miles without stopping, but in such exertions the poor obedient creature fatigues itself so exceedingly that its master is frequently obliged to kill it immediately, to prevent a lingering death that would ensue. In general, they can go thirty miles without stopping, and that without any great or dangerous effort. Obsequious at their call, the docile tribe yield to the sled their necks and whirl them swift, o'er hill and dale heaped into one expanse of marbled snow as far as I can sweep, with a blue crust of ice unbounded glazed. Sledges in Kamchatka the only method of travelling in this dreary country during the winter is drawn on a sledge by the strong, nimble, and active dogs of the country. They travel with great expedition. Captain King relates that during his stay there, a courier with dispatches drawn by them performed a journey of 270 miles in less than four days. The sledges are usually drawn by five dogs, four of them yoked two and two abreast. The foremost acts as a leader to the rest. The reins, being fastened to a collar round the leading dog's neck, are of little use in directing the pack, the driver depending chiefly on their obedience to his voice, with which he animates them to proceed. Great care and attention are consequently used in training up for those leaders, which are more valuable according to their steadiness and docility. The sum of forty roubles, or nine pounds, being no unusual price for them. The rider has a crooked stick, answering the purpose of both whip and reins, with which, by striking on the snow, he regulates the speed of the dogs, or stops them at his pleasure. When they are inattentive to their duty, he often chastises them by throwing it at them. He discovers great dexterity in regaining his stick, which is the greatest difficulty attending his situation, for, if he should happen to lose it, the dogs immediately discover the circumstance, and never fail to set off at full speed, and continue to run till their strength is exhausted, or till the carriage is overturned and dashed to pieces or hurried down a precipice. End of chapter 5 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 6 of Frostiana This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Skating In giddy circles whirling variously, the skater fleetly threads the mazy throng. Trust not incautiously the smooth expanse, for oft a treacherous thaw ere yet perceived, saps by degrees the solid seeming mass. The winter of England usually allows but few of those pastimes which continue for so long a period in more northerly regions. On blithesome frolics bent the youthful swains, while every work of man is laid at rest, fond o'er the river crowd in various sports, and revelry dissolved where mixing glad, Happiest of all the train, the raptured boy lashes the whirling top, or where the Rhine branches out in many a long canal extends, from every province swarming void of care. Batavia rushes forth, and as they sweep on sounding skates a thousand different ways, or circular poise swift as the wind along, the then gay land is maddened all to joy, nor less the northern courts wide o'er the snow pour a new pomp eager on rapid sleds. Their vigorous youth in bold contention wheel the long resounding course, meantime to raise the manly strife with high-blooming charms, flushed by the season Scandinavia's dames or Russia's buxom daughters glow around. Much of the above description, however, has for these few weeks past been realised by the busy crowds assembled on our principal rivers and reservoirs. The canal in St. James's Park, the Serpentine, and the noble Thames rivers still daily present to our observation a delightful spectacle, a complete frost fair to which the pencil of a Teniers or a Wilkie could alone do justice. The compiler of this work has been highly gratified with seeing the number of young persons engaged in the active and healthful employment of skating, and from a view to their improvement in this useful and elegant art, he has collected together some valuable information on the subject, which he offers to the notice of his young friends, accompanied by his best wishes for the success of his instructions. These, if attended to, cannot fail the making of an elegant and fearless skater. Origin of Skating 
Although the ancients were remarkable for their dexterity in most of the athletic sports, yet skating seems to have been unknown to them. According to the antiquaries, this exercise made its appearance in the 13th century. It probably derived its origin in Holland, where it was practiced not only as a graceful and elegant amusement, but as an expeditious mode of travelling when the lakes and canals were frozen up during winter. In Holland, long journeys are made upon skates with ease and expedition, but in general, less attention is there paid to graceful and elegant movements than to the expedition and celerity of what is called journey skating. It is only in those countries where it is considered as an amusement that its graceful attitudes and movements can be studied, and there is no exercise whatever better calculated to set off the human figure to advantage. The acquirement of most exercises may be attained at an advanced period of life, but to become an expert skater it is necessary to begin the practice of the art at a very early age. It is difficult to reduce the art of skating to a system. It is principally by the imitation of a good skater that a young beginner can form his own practice. The English, though often remarkable for feats of agility upon skates, are very deficient in gracefulness, which is partly owing to the construction of the skates. They are too much curved in the surface which embraces the ice. Consequently, they involuntarily bring the users of them round on the outside upon a quick and small circle, whereas the skater, by using skates of a different construction, less curved, has the command of his stroke and can enlarge or diminish the circle according to his own wish or desire. Rules for learners. Those who wish to be proficients should begin at an early period of life, and should first endeavour to throw off the fear which always attends the commencement of an apparently hazardous amusement. They will soon acquire a facility of moving on the inside. When they have done this, they must endeavour to acquire the movement on the outside of the skates, which is nothing more than throwing themselves upon the outer edge of the skate, and making the balance of their body tend towards that side, which will necessarily enable them to form a semicircle. In this, much assistance may be derived from placing a bag of lead shot in the pocket next to the foot employed in making the outside stroke, which will produce an artificial poise of the body. This afterwards will become natural by practice. At the commencement of the outside stroke, the knee of the employed limb should be a little bent, and gradually brought to a rectilineal position when the stroke is completed. The following rules should also be carefully practiced and strictly attended to. They will be of the greatest service. 1. When the practitioner becomes expert in forming the semicircle with both feet, he is then to join them together and proceed progressively and alternately with both feet, which will carry him forward with a graceful movement. 2. Care should be taken to use very little muscular exertion, for the impelling motion should proceed from the mechanical impulse of the body thrown into such a position as to regulate the stroke. 3. At taking the outside stroke, the body ought to be thrown forward easily, the unemployed limb kept in a direct line with the body, and the face and eyes directly looking forward. The unemployed foot ought to be stretched towards the ice, with the toes in a direct line with the leg. 4. In the time of making the curve, the body must be gradually and almost imperceptibly raised, and the unemployed limb brought in the same manner forward, so that, at finishing the curve, the body will bend a small degree backward, and the unemployed foot will be about two inches before the other ready to embrace the ice and form a correspondent curve. 5. The muscular movement of the whole body must correspond with the movement of the skate, and should be regulated so as to be almost imperceptible to the spectators. 6. Particular attention should be paid in carrying round the head and eyes with a regular and imperceptible motion, for nothing so much diminishes the grace and elegance of skating as sudden jerks and exertions, which are so frequently used by the generality of skaters. 7. The management of the arms likewise deserves attention. There is no mode of disposing of them more gracefully in skating outside than folding the hands into each other or using a muff. There are various feats of activity and manoeuvres used upon skates, but they are so various that we cannot pretend to detail them. Moving on the outside is the primary object for a skater to attain, and when he becomes an adept in that, he will easily acquire a facility in executing other branches of the art. There are few exercises but will afford him hints of elegant and graceful attitudes. For example, nothing can be more beautiful than the attitude of drawing the bow and arrow while the skater is making a large circle on the outside. The manual exercise and military salutes have likewise a pretty effect when used by an expert skater. Skating is an amusement well calculated for the severity of winter, as it contributes to promote both insensible perspiration and the circulation of the blood. Hence, a society has even been formed in Edinburgh under the name of the Skating Club, the avowed object of which is the improvement of this recreation so as to reduce it to the rules of art.
Excellence, however, can be attained only by observing the motions of a skilful skater. This innocent pursuit, especially in the south of Britain where the winters are generally mild, should not be encouraged unless the ice be of considerable thickness. At the same time, some precaution is necessary to retire from this enticing diversion in proper time, because the body, being thrown into sensible perspiration, is thus rendered more susceptible of cold, and, unless due attention be paid to this circumstance, a cold will probably be the consequence. We have heard that some skaters in the fens of Cambridgeshire and Huntingdonshire have skated two miles in two minutes, the strokes on an average being each ten yards. This velocity exceeds that of most racehorses, and the fatigue occasioned by it is much less. A very remarkable skating feat is said to have taken place during the late frost. A Mr. Maxwell, celebrated for his skill and dexterity in this useful art, skated from Longacre to St. James's Park in four minutes and fifty seconds. This was for a wager, and the given time was five minutes. To the native of Holland, skating is quite as familiar as walking, and he puts on his skates with the same indifference as we do our shoes. These instruments, indeed, are indispensable to the Dutch in the winter season, and are used by men, women, and children constantly. The women skate to market with provisions, and children of five or six years old and upwards accompany them, not lazily hanging at their backs or on their arms, but each little skater with winged feet flies after its mother, and carries a little basket of eggs or other articles along with it. Interesting scene. How admirably adapted are the manners and customs of mankind to the climates appointed for them by Providence. Skating is pursued in England as an amusement only, and for a single week perhaps in the course of the year, but in Holland it is absolutely necessary, and supplies a cheap and commodious method of transport to all classes of people. The Dutch skates are not so finely shaped as those we use, and the skaters are more remarkable for the ease than elegance of their execution. End of Frostiana by George Davis Recording by Lewis Fletcher